All right. Um, I'm going to do my best to keep this sermon under half an hour. My best. So the only way I can do this, brethren, if, is if I've got my stopwatch on. So let's get that set. All right, start. All right, Romans chapter 1. So I'm not, uh, we haven't turned this to this passage because, you know, of your favorite topic. No, we're going to be looking at uh, verse number 16 here. Romans chapter 1, verse number 16, okay? In fact, this is a, a great uh, verse here. It says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So the title for the sermon tonight is Power of God Unto Salvation. Okay, so what is the main ministry of our church besides when we come together and, and uh, you know, worship God, praise God, fellowship together? The, work, the main work that we have, the main ministry outside of this church is to preach the gospel, right? To see people saved. We want to take this message of salvation that we've been able to enjoy and let our neighbors know about it, let our community know about it so they can also go to heaven. You know, someone came to you given the gospel. Hey, now it's your turn to go to someone else and show them the power of God unto salvation. Now let's look at that one more time. Verse number 16 there, Romans 1, 16. For I am not ashamed of what? Of the gospel of Christ. Why is he not ashamed? For it is. What is? The gospel, okay? The gospel is the power of God unto salvation, okay? So when we want to see people saved, we need to make sure we have the power of God to be able to do that. What is the power of God? The gospel, okay? Now, the gospel. Now, listen, tonight I'm not going through the entire presentation that we do door to door, okay? I'm focused on the gospel message, the gospel, okay? Why am I preaching on this today? Because during my, my 40 days, as you guys know, I've been going out 40 days soul winning, uh, sometimes by myself, sometimes with my children, sometimes with other people here in this church. One thing that I noticed from several people is a lack of emphasis on the gospel. Okay? Now, you know, they'll say, the same people might say, you know, look, I'm not criticizing anybody. All I want to do today is sharpen your sword a little bit more, okay? Just sharpen the way you explain the gospel to people. I'm not angry at anybody. In fact, I'm delighted. As soon as anybody goes door to door, that's success in my eyes, okay? But that doesn't mean we can't improve. That doesn't mean we can't do better, okay? And a lot of people are going to be focused on different things, okay? If you've seen different gospel presentations online, people are going to be focused on different things. What you must be focused on, though, what is the power of God unto salvation is the gospel. You know, you say, what is the gospel? Well, we'll get to that in a moment. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. If it is the power of God unto salvation, then isn't this what we want to emphasize? Isn't this what we want people to understand and comprehend? And let me tell you, if, you, if, you, if the person at the door understands the gospel, it's going to be easy from there. You're not going to have a lot of arguments if they've understood the gospel. If you've not explained the gospel very, very well, then you're going to have a lot of people you know, arguing back, not, you know, not appreciating what you've just tried to explain to them. So we must emphasize this point. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 1 says, Moreover, brethren, <clears throat> I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, okay? So Paul is saying, look, I'm declaring the gospel. This is what I preach to you, which also you have received and wherein you stand, by which also, also you are saved. Yeah, that's it. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. It's what saves you. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, right? Again, he's saying, look, this is what I preached to you, unless you have believed in vain, verse number three, for I delivered unto you. Again, he's saying, look, I delivered this to you, First of all, that which I also received. So Paul's saying, look, I also received this. Now that I received it, I'm making sure I pass it on, right? Preaching the gospel to others. And then he says this, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So what is he saying there? Verse number one says, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you. Verse number Four, uh, three, sorry, for I delivered unto you, that's the preaching unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that it was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. What is the gospel? Oh, that you're a sinner. No, that's not the gospel. What is the gospel? That there's a heaven and hell. No, that's not the gospel. Okay? What is the gospel? That, you know, it's just believing. No, no, that's not the gospel. The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is the power of God unto salvation. Okay, now a lot of, you know, I, I think the reason sometimes we just skip or, or glance over this 
is because many times we're dealing with people that know this message already. They've seen the Easter movies, or they've gone to some Christian church. So everyone's, pretty much everyone's heard. Isn't it more of a rarity if someone has not heard that Jesus died for them, or something along those lines? Most people in this world, at least in Australia, have heard, know that Jesus died, was buried and rose again three days later. They they have some understanding of that. And so because we, we, we know that people have that understanding, we tend to just glance over it sometimes. Okay, but no, this is the power of God unto salvation. Why are they not yet saved then? If they've heard this before, it's because it's not been explained to them properly. You know, they've heard of it, but it hasn't processed in their mind. What does this mean? And so the, the goal of my sermon today is to explain this. Please go to chapter 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 17. 1 Corinthians, you're already there, but I've got chapter 1. Verse number 17. Now when I said that being a sinner is not the gospel, or faith on Christ is not the gospel. I'm not saying that you skip those things. That's not what I'm focused on today. All of that is important, okay? But what I really want to focus on is what the gospel message is. Look at verse number 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, okay? Now, that's a great passage, right? That Those that say, well, you've got to get baptized to be saved. Well, Paul just said he was not sent to baptize, but to preach the gospel. So preaching the gospel is not getting baptized. Okay? That's a great passage to turn to. I don't really need to turn that, that often. But anyway, it says here, Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. So what did he just mention there? The gospel, preaching the gospel is the cross of Christ. Verse number 18. For the preaching of the cross. So what is the gospel? The preaching of the gospel? The preaching of the cross. Okay? Is to them that perish foolishness, but look at this, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. The power of God. There it is again, right? What is the power of God unto salvation? The, the cross, the death, burial, the resurrection of Christ. Let's get going. Verse number 19. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world is by wisdom, knew not God, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Okay, so the preaching that saves people that believe. Look at verse number 22. For the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek, seek after wisdom. But we preach. Remember he said he preaches the gospel? What does he preach? We preach Christ crucified. Unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks. Look at this. Christ the power of God. And the wisdom of God. So you notice that twice in this passage, the power of God is mentioned, and several times it talks about His death, the cross, the crucifixion, right? That's part of the gospel message, the death, the burial, and resurrection of Christ. This is the power of God unto salvation. Why do you keep saying that, Pastor Kevin? We already know that. Yeah, I know that, okay? I know you know that, okay? But what I want you to be able to do is be able to communicate that to your neighbor, okay? And so this is the purpose of the sermon today, all right? Now, if you can please... Uh, go to, I'll get you to turn to, uh, well, let me think about it. Let me, I'll get you to turn to John. Please go to the book of John. I'll just uh, quote some other passage to, passages to you. Okay, what, what does gospel mean? A lot of people have heard of the word gospel, and sometimes I'll mention it. So normally when I give them the bad news, they're a sinner on their way to hell, but does God want you to go to hell? No. He did something so you don't have to go to hell, right? So I'll say to them, well, you know, I've given you the bad news, now I want to give you the good news. In fact, you, have you heard of the word gospel before? I say, yeah, yeah, gospel. I say, what, what, do you know what gospel means? They go, no. Well, gospel means good news, okay? In, uh, in Galatians, uh, sorry, not in Galatians, in Romans chapter 10, verse 15, Romans chapter 10, verse 15, it says, And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace. And then it reiterates it and bring glad tidings of good things. So what is the gospel of peace? What gives us peace between us and God? Well, glad tidings, good things, okay? What does gospel mean? It means glad tidings. It means uh, good news, in fact. What's tidings? News, okay? The gospel means good news. And so we give people the bad news at the beginning, say, but hey, now I'm going to give you the gospel. Now I'm going to give you the good news, all right? And of course, we get to the good news of Christ's sacrifice. This is what we em- want to emphasize. We don't want to spend, you know, five minutes, ten minutes just telling somebody how bad of a sinner they are. Most people, even those that think they're good enough for heaven, by the time you have a little discussion with them, and look, if someone says to me, you know, I'm a good person, I don't really debate that with them too much, 
okay? Because I know very quickly they're going to admit that they're not perfect. Very quickly they're going to admit that they're not, uh, that they've made mistakes, that they've sinned, okay? That's something I don't really dwell on, right? And so if someone says to me, well, you know, I'm a good person, I'm trying my best, I'll usually say to them, because I don't want them to think that I think going to heaven is being based on how good you are. I'll usually just say to them, hey, you're probably better than I am. You know, maybe you're better than I am. So immediately by saying that, you know, I'm not trying to make them feel horrible for giving a bad answer, right? I'm trying to like just make a bit of a light of a situation, but at the same time for them to realize, actually, you know what? I don't think I'm, I'm even as good as the next person, right? That I have a problem. I don't believe going to heaven is based on how good I am, in fact, okay? And then I'll usually turn around because I've already said, look, I'm actually not the, the good one, okay? Maybe you're better than me, you know, but, you know, I think you'd be ready to admit that you're not perfect, you've done wrong things. Oh, yeah, I'm not perfect. Straight away, people can automatically know that they've run, done something wrong, right? That's not something you need to dwell on. But when it comes to Ray Comfort, you know, and his way of the master, I don't know, have you guys ever seen that stuff? Yeah, yeah man. You know, what does he dwell on? Does he, does, he, does he emphasize and dwell on the gospel message? No. no, it's about how wicked of a sinner you are. So you've lied. Okay, you've admitted that you've lied. Have you stolen something? Oh, man, that makes you a thief. That makes you a liar. Have you looked at a woman with lust? Hey, that makes you an adulterer at heart. Ah, you're so wicked, you know? And then it's like, but Jesus died for you. And, uh, you know, if you just live for Christ, you'll be all right. And if you just live in holiness. No, he confuses. He, he touches on Jesus, but that is not his emphasis. I mean, he'll just glance over it. It's not the power of God unto salvation, what he preaches. You know, it's the power of damnation is what it is. You know, trying to make people think, well, I'm so bad, therefore I must be good. I mean, look, if you just keep telling someone how bad you are, what's going to process in their mind? They're going to be thinking, well, I'm so bad, yeah, I'm so bad, bad, bad. I must try to be good then. I must try to do better. That's what's going to be processed in the mind if that's what you're focused on, right? But here's the thing, the gospel is good news. How is telling someone how wicked of a sinner they are, how they're not living in holiness, so they don't mean they just focus on that and just just hammer someone of a bad of a sinner? How is that good news? How is that leaving somebody the gospel? That's what they're going to be left with, right? And so, of course, we don't do that in our church. Very quickly, people are, admit, are willing to admit that they're a sinner, and you know, then you show them what the Bible says. Whereas a sinner, you know, you're ultimately going to end up in the lake of fire, which is the second death, right? And so that that, that ought to be if you explain the gospel to someone a very quick thing. You want to get to the good news. You want to get to the gospel. You want to get to explaining what God did for them so they don't have to go to hell, right? And so this is what we need to focus on. So what is, what took place on the cross though? Because, you know, it's easy to say, well, Jesus died for you. Okay, he died for you. He rose again three days later. Okay, but what does that mean? Okay, just, just understanding that took place is not enough. You know, the Catholics believe that, the Pentecostals believe that, all right, the Mormons believe that, the JWs believe some type of version of that, the Methodists believe that, you know, everyone that names themselves Christians believes that Jesus died on the cross for them and rose again three days later. Anyone that wants to label themselves as a Christian, but you know they're not saved. There's many unsaved Christians out there, okay, many unsaved, why, why? because they haven't understood what it means when Jesus died on the cross. They know He did it, but what does that have to do with me? Don't I still have to go to church? Don't I still have to get baptized? Don't I still have to try to be a good person? Well, let me just read some passages to you. You're in John chapter 1. We'll get, we'll get there soon. But 1 John chapter 2 verse 1. I'm reading from 1 John chapter 2 verse 1. It says, My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, for he, and this is important, for he, that's Jesus, is the propitiation, that's a big word, for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So what is the meaning of the cross? What took place? What is this sacrifice? What is this gospel? That Jesus became the propitiation for us. Now listen, you go to someone's door and you say that to them, that's still going to go over their head. <laughs> then I, I mean, maybe some people in this church don't even understand what that means, right? That word to propitiate is to appease or satisfy. Okay, to appease or satisfy. What is that saying? That's saying that the punishment for sin was satisfied on, on Jesus Christ, on His sacrifice. Okay, it's satisfied. What that, that means, there's nothing more needed. 
to satisfy God's judgment, God's justice, God's anger. It's been completely accomplished in Christ, okay? So this is important because when you explain to somebody, hey, you know, you're deserving of hellfire, hey, but instead of God's wrath coming upon you, God's anger upon you, God's judgment upon you, it was actually put on Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ took your place, so you don't have to pay that penalty. He did everything needed, so you don't have to pay anything yourself. Okay, that's why that's important. You're in John chapter 1, verse number 29. John chapter 1, verse 29. It says, the next day, John seeth Jesus, that's John the Baptist, seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. So what else, did, what, what does the cross mean? It means that Jesus, through that sacrifice, took sin away from the world. Okay, it says that taketh away the sin of the world. Okay, it was completely removed from the world. It was put on Jesus, right? That's what he means. Now, I'll just read some other passages. Can you please go to, uh, go to Ephesians chapter 1? Go to Ephesians chapter 1. I'll read to you from 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 18. You go to Ephesians 1. I'll go to 1 Peter 1 18. And, uh, you know, we, we went through this not long ago for our Peter series. But it says, for as much as you know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold and from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So this passage is telling us we were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. Okay? What does it mean to redeem? Okay? Have you ever redeemed a voucher? All right, redeem this voucher and get your free, whatever, small chips or whatever it is, right? To redeem is to buy or to clear of payment, okay? So no further payment is required. When you redeem something, you buy and you clear it of payment, okay? No further payment required. So we know this, Pastor Kevin. Again, I know you know this, but you need to teach this to, to your neighbor, okay? They need to understand because, listen, a lot of the arguments you get back after explaining the gospel is because they haven't understood that it's all been paid for. They know Jesus died. I already knew, in their mind, yeah, I already knew that. You're not telling me anything I don't already know, okay? They need to understand it's been accomplished. It's done, all right? It is finished, Jesus Christ said. You're in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. It says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. So what else? His sacrifice gives us forgiveness of sins. We're forgiven by that process. There's no further process to take in order to have your sins forgiven. You don't need to go to some Roman Catholic priest, right, inside his little booth and confess your sins for forgiveness. It's all been forgiven in Jesus Christ. All right? Now, just read another passage. Can you please go to Galatians 3? Go to Galatians 3. I'll read to you from 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, which reads, For there is one God and one mediator between man, God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. So it's saying here that Jesus gave himself a ransom for all. What's a ransom? Have you ever heard of someone having to pay a ransom? to, you know, release a prisoner, release someone that's been kidnapped. That's what it means. A ransom is the price paid to free a prisoner, a slave or a kidnapped person, okay? So Jesus paid the ransom. Hey, we were slaves, right? Slaves of sin, okay? We were kind of, you know, away from the Lord, lost without, you know, any hope of salvation. Or Jesus steps in and pays the ransom so we can be free. All right, what an amazing thought, right? That Jesus paid that ransom. That ransom was himself. It was his life that he gave for us. You're in Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. What am I emphasizing then, brethren? Not the fact that Jesus died and, and was buried, rose again. We know that. That's important. Of course, that's important. But what does that mean? Okay, that's what you've got to drive home to the person you're preaching to when you tell them that Jesus died for their sins. Don't just tell them he died for your sins. They know that. Don't just tell them he rose again three days later. They know that. Okay, explain what this means. The price has been paid. 
God is appeased. He's satisfied. It's all been, it's a ransom. You can go free now. Okay? That's what's important. That's the message of the gospel. Now, Galatians 3.13. We're still on the same point. What took place on the cross? And this is really important, really important for you to drive home. Okay? Because, yeah, okay, in, in their mind, they understand some idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been paid for. But, you know, in what sense, right? It's been paid for. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ hath redeemed us. There's that word again. And by the way, avoid these words. Avoid the ransom. Avoid redeemed. Because they don't get it. These are kind of churchy words. These are biblical words, right? That you probably didn't even understand until you started reading your Bible and started to go to church. Sometimes for us, we use these words. We're so comfortable using these words because we know what we mean. But we forget that the person at the door has pretty much no idea what some of these words are. Even the word righteousness. You know, you've got to be made righteous. I know, I was going to church a lot of my life, and I didn't know what the word righteous meant. And that sounds stupid, right? Righteous means to do right things. <laughs> but I didn't know. What does it mean to be righteous? What's that big word, right? So be careful about the words you use. We want to be able to explain, use simple language for people, right? Now, Galatians 3.13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. This is so important. Okay? That Christ was made a curse for us. Okay? So how, in what sense did Jesus pay it all? Well, instead of the curse falling upon me, on you, the punishment of God upon you and me, no, Jesus became the curse for us. He took it all. He took the punishment. He took, it's, it's not that, you know, the, the, the punishment of our sin disappeared. It didn't disappear. It was put on Christ. He bore the brunt. He became a curse for us. That's the sacrifice. That's what the gospel means. He became the curse. So we don't have to be cursed by God. We can be released from the curse because the curse fell on somebody else, on Jesus. He's our substitute, right? And also in, now this is what you need to drive home. This is so important. They need to understand. The wrong things you've done, I've done, my silent partner, the wrong things the entire world has done was put on Jesus, okay? He took the punishment for us instead of us being punished. Uh, uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he hath made him to be sin for us. Hey, Galatians said curse for us. This one says he was made sin for us, who knew not sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He became sin for us. All of your sins were put on Jesus. Okay? That means the sins are not on you anymore, are they? They're on Jesus. That's his sacrifice. That's the penalty. That's the payment. That's the ransom. It's all been done for. It's all been taken care of. So important for you to drive home. Not just that he died and rose again. What does it mean? He paid the price. He satisfied the anger and the justice of God. He took on all our sin. He took on our curse. It was put on Jesus so we can go free. Okay? That's the message. Now listen, if you drive this home, I'm not telling you how to word things word for word. I'm not trying to turn anyone into a robot. But if you're clear about this and they get it, all right? I know I've seen Brother Michael. He gives this illustration. He says, he's got a Bible pretend. He says, let's say this is Jesus and this is you. Oh no, that's not the example you give. But I've seen uh, one of my pastors give this example. You know, these are your burdens, these are your sins on Jesus, where when he died on the cross, they were put on Jesus, and they're all gone from your hand. Use whatever analogy, use whatever you can to help that person understand. Listen, if, this, if, if in their mind they get it, if it makes sense, you're not going to get many arguments after it. When you explain, because at this point, everybody knows. Like, everything, you just, everything I just went through, they know this. They just haven't understood it. Okay, once they understand it, then you're not going to have to argue much afterwards, okay, because everything flows naturally from that, right? Like I said, every Christian organization agrees with what I just said, okay? But where does the disagreement come? Well, how do you receive salvation, okay? What do we, we know what Jesus did, we know what God did, what do we have to do? Well, be a good person, go to church, get baptized, right? That's what, that, that's what they'll think, right? So let me just give you a few tips so far, and we're you know, running out of time. But number one, when you explain the gospel, don't talk about faith, because we know receiving the salvation is by faith. 
It's by believing what Jesus Christ done. Don't go there just yet, okay? You don't want to get into an unnecessary words, faith and works. When you haven't explained the power of God yet. The power of God unto salvation, okay? Don't get into that just yet. You don't want to get into something that you're going to, you may dispute or the free gift at this point in time, okay? You don't want to get into something that you dispute. Find common ground. Like I said, everybody agrees with this, okay? You're just trying to gra- you know, dr- uh, get at home, get them to understand what it means. Now, as I said, if you do a good job emphasizing the gospel, which is the sacrifice of Christ, you've already defeated most of their arguments that might come if you, if you just glanced over the death, burial, and res- resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, this is what I do. Generally, when I explain to them that Jesus died for, especially if I'm speaking to somebody who's got a Christian background, now, this is something I started to adopt in the 40 days of soul winning that I've just been doing. So it's not something, it's something brand new, but I, I realized it's been very effective, okay? And, I, and I'd say to them this, I'd say, well, you've heard that before, haven't you? Yeah. And then I'd say, because I'm, I'm trying to find the common ground. I'm, try, I'm not trying to make them feel like they're stupid or something, right? So I say to them, well, can you finish this sentence for me? Jesus paid for all of my, and like nine out of 10 times, they've finished at sins. It's like, yeah, you're right. So if Jesus, and this is what I say, so if Jesus paid for all of your sins, how much do you have to pay? Oh, nothing. Exactly. In fact, those are the very words that came out of my mouth with a young a teenager, uh, uh, well, maybe it was about 16 or 17. And as soon as he said, well, nothing, and I said, exactly, all of a sudden, you just see it from his face. The light bulb turned on. He just turned on. He already knew it. He already knew that Jesus died. He already knew that Jesus rose again from the dead. But he just finally realized, oh, it's been completely paid for. Therefore, I don't have to pay anything. And he had a big smile on his face. Probably before this, he's thinking, well, what do I have to do? I'm trying to be good. I'm trying to do the best I can. Is it good enough? As soon as he realized, oh, I don't have to do anything. Now, hey, he's ripe. Now I just have to tell him, all you have to do now is believe it. Okay? All you have to do is trust what Jesus Christ has done for you. Because that flows perfectly with what we just covered about the power of God and to salvation, the gospel message. All right? So some other examples that I sometimes use, and some of you guys have heard this as well, is, you know, I'll just say the billion dollar example. I used to say million dollars, but I'm ch- changing it to, because a million dollars these days isn't much, right? <laughs> like every Australian's like a millionaire these days, right? So now we use the billion, billion dollar example. It's like, you know, if you, were, you, know, if you owed a billion dollars and you can't afford it, you know, you, you, know, you can't afford it, and, you know, if, if you can't pay it, you may, may go to jail. Hey, but this is what, you know, let's say, I don't use my silent partner. What if, let's say, Jason, let's, you know, what if Jason stepped in and paid the billion dollars for you? Guess what? The person that you owed money to will be happy because it's been, it's been appeased, it's been satisfied, it's been paid for, right? The propitiation for our sins, well, you don't talk about that, but, you know, they explain that. Hey, and you're happy because you no longer have the debt. You can go free. I'll use that example. It's like, oh, yeah, that makes sense, right? And so the emphasis is to explain to them that God's wrath, God's judgment, God's anger, the punishment that you deserved was put completely on Christ, completely paid for, okay? And if you can just emphasize that, honestly, it makes it easy afterwards. It makes it really easy, okay? Let's talk about faith very quickly. Acts 16, verse 30, if you can. I'll just read it to you because I'm running out of time. I'll try to keep it within half an hour. Acts 16, this is where I go. So once I explain to them what Jesus Christ has done, we use our regular verses that we use in our gospel presentation, right? I go to Acts 16, verse 30, and brought them out and said, Sirs, I love this question. Please add this to your gospel presentation if you don't have it already. Okay, the reason I bring this, I bring this up, what must I do to be saved? Because this is the same question I'm going to ask them when we go over the gospel again. I'm going to literally, word for word, ask them the same question. What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. So then, what do you do here? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. The say, hey, you know, when I asked you at the beginning, you thought going to church was important, was part of going to heaven. Hey, you said, you know, being a good person, you think you're good enough for heaven. But what does it say? Does it say you have to be a good person? No. Does it say you have to go to church? No. Does it say you have to give money to the poor? No. Does it say you have to help the old lady cross the street? No. Does it say you have to get baptized? No. What does the people say? I don't know. You know, the golden rule. Does it say do the golden rule? No. What does it say? It says believe. Yeah, just believe, right? Believe what Jesus Christ has done for us. You know, and then you take him to John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And look, this is where you need to explain what believing means. Because again, all these religions there, they say the words believe. They say the words faith. I was listening to, just to prepare for this, I was listening to a Pentecostal presentation of the gospel. All right? And by believing, by faith, 
They mean be a good person. Honestly, that's what they mean. If you're not being a good person, you're not believing. That's what they teach, right? You've got to just live, live for Christ. You know, that's what he meant. You know, the woman was explaining that she heard the, the gospel, whatever it was, and for nine months, it was a woman preacher, but, you know, I wanted to listen. Right? She was like, for nine months, it took me nine months, and I finally gave my life to Jesus. What? That's what believing means? I never heard that before. <laughs> you know? I, I believe my kids are going to do well in math this year in school. Does that mean I gave my life to them? Is that what it means to believe? <laughs> no, to believe is to trust. And, and again, you've got to explain this. Understand. You can't just, well, it says believe. And, and, and expect them to understand what it means to believe. They don't understand it. They've, they've been brainwashed by their religious institutions to think that belief is works to some extent. Some measure of works, okay? And so you need to explain. Well, belief is just trusting. And, uh, you know, and I don't, again, I don't emphasize, if I, if I f- focus on the gospel presentation, I don't really need to work too much on this, right? But it just says, you know, I'll just read a passage to you in 1 Timothy 4.10. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because, now look, notice the next words, we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. So we see how trust and belief can be used interchangeably, right? To believe something is to trust in that thing. And so at that point, that's what I'll say to them. Look, if I said to you, because I've explained the gospel message, Jesus did it all. If I said to you that, hey, I'm going to heaven because, well, first of all, I'm going to heaven because, I'm a, I'm a, first of all, I'm a sinner. I can't make it to heaven on my own. But Jesus died for me, remember? The gospel message. He died for me. He paid everything that was needed for me to go to heaven. And then I'll say to them this. Am I trusting Kevin to go to heaven? Or am I trusting Jesus? And quite often, they'll just say nine out of ten times, yeah, you're trusting Jesus. I said to them, well, what if I said it like this? And I'll, I'll pretty much use the same words I used before when I asked them, what do you think you have to do to go to heaven? What if I said to you that going to heaven is based on me, how good I am? You know, I've, I've been going to church every week. In fact, I pastor a church. You know, I've been baptized, I've, given, I've helped out poor people, I've helped my brother when he needed something. Is my trust now on Jesus or is it on Kevin? And at that point, yeah, it's on Kevin. Yeah, so I'm not believing on Jesus, am I? I'm believing on Kevin. And what, is the, what, we, what must we do? We must believe on Jesus Christ, that he has paid for it all. Okay? Because if you trust some element of yourself, your faith is, yeah, maybe partly on Jesus, partly on yourself. No, your belief has to be fully on what Jesus Christ has done for you. It's already been paid for. Now, please go to Acts chapter 8 for me. We're almost done. Acts chapter 8. I'm at 32 minutes. All right, let's just get this done. Acts chapter 8, verse 29. Acts chapter 8, verse 29. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Esaias and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? So Philip says to this unsaved man, Do you understand what you read? I want you to think about that for a minute, okay? You need to explain to them what it means to believe. You need to explain to them what it means that Jesus died for them, okay? Uh, the natural man cannot understand these things, okay? They, I know Jesus died for me. I get faith, but then they mix up faith with something else, right? So look, look what he says in verse number 20, 31. And he said, how can I, that's how can I understand, right? Except some man should guide me. And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. Brethren, if you did this in your gospel presentation, you need to stop it, okay? Where you show somebody to believe, and you say, so what do you have to do? Well, you know, be a good person. Uh, let, let me show you again. What does it say? And you can show me another passage. It says believe. What do you have to do? Well, I don't know. Do you have to go to church? And you just show them again. Just show them, like, you're, not, you're not explaining. You just show them. Well, see, it says believe here. Again, their understanding of belief is faith on Jesus and whatever else. They'll say to you, yeah, I believe, right? But listen, they cannot understand unless a man should guide them, okay? You, with the Holy Spirit of God, you have to explain that faith is your complete trust on Jesus, on his death and resurrection, that that's all you're trusting in. It's been done. It's been completely paid for in order for you to go to heaven, Okay? Just showing them verses and getting them to read it is not going to convince them. They need a man to guide them. That's your job as the preacher. That's your job, preaching the gospel, to guide people. Show them the passage and then guide them what it means. Don't just rattle off a hundred verses about faith and belief. It's not going to do it. You've got to explain to them, okay? You've got to help them 
understand. All right. Now, brethren, I did have a little bit more, but just very quickly. So once they get it that Jesus paid it all, don't you think that the, 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 you know, um, understanding the gift is easy? I mean, something's been completely paid for, then what's been offered is a gift, naturally, right? And of course, we get to the, our passages on the gift. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so there, as I see, the Bible calls uh, eternal life a gift, okay? And if it's a gift, how much do you have to pay for it? Well, nothing. Well, if, if you've explained that it's all been paid for already, they'll get that. How was it paid for, though? Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus Christ, death, burial, resurrection is how the gift was paid for. And of course, if they're still stuck on that, you can go to Ephesians 2.28. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. All right. Now, in so, just to just some uh, few last points here. If they say to you, but we have to try to do good things, don't just be like, don't like shut them down, okay? Because naturally people think, well, I've still got to be a good person. Isn't that what we come to church for? To learn how we can be good people? Isn't, like, once you're saved, don't you want to now learn how to be righteous? How to be like Jesus? So that's important, you know? You don't want to just turn around and say, well, actually, you know, you can, you can just be as evil and wicked as you want to be. Because in their mind, they're still thinking that's salvation, okay? So how I will turn that around is, well, you know, you still should try to live good. Yeah, you should try to be a good person. But that doesn't get you to heaven, right? Because, you know, you, you're not good enough, right? You already admit it, you're a sinner. You're not good enough for heaven. So the only thing that gets you to heaven is not your goodness, not your righteousness, but the righteousness of Jesus Christ, okay? But yeah, once we are saved, we should try to be good people. I'm not trying to make them feel stupid. I want them to understand, yeah, we also believe you should try to be good people, but it has nothing to do with your salvation, all right? It's separate from the gospel message. I had uh, someone say to me, but, you know, yes, okay, you've, you explained to me that Jesus paid it all, but you know what? We should try to pay him back. It's like, what? Do you know what Jesus went through to pay for it? You think you can pay it back? Like, if I, if I bought you something and it cost me $10 and you paid it back, wouldn't you have to pay $10 back? Wouldn't you have to pay the whole thing back? Well, how are you, you know, how's a man going to pay back something that only Jesus Christ could do? I mean, first of all, to pay it back, you'd have to be a sinless person. Okay, secondly, you have to be God. Okay, you'd have to have the blood of God. You know, thirdly, you have to have all the sins of mankind put upon you. You'd have to become the curse of God, and you have to be crucified on the cross. That's the only way you could possibly pay it back, and it's impossible to do, of course. So, you know, the idea, well, we've got to pay it back. Well, turn that around. Don't make them feel stupid. Just say to them, well, you cannot pay it back. There's only one that could pay it in the first place. That's why, if you could pay it, then you wouldn't need Jesus, right? <laughs> Jesus paid it because he was the only one that could pay it. Yeah, but as appreciation of what Jesus has done, as appreciation that salvation is a free gift, yeah, you know, you should try to do things that please God. So you don't want to make people feel stupid, all right? Because, I, I, you know, they're coming from good intentions, but they just need to understand the separation between what is salvation and what is trying to live godly, you know, for the Lord God. And the last one is this. Sometimes when you get to the belief part, they'll say, but, you know, any, they'll say, but what? Well, anyone can say they believe, right? They'll, they'll say that. Anyone can say they believe. Listen, agree with them. Yes, anyone can say they believe. You're right. Just because you say you believe doesn't mean you believe. You know, anyone can say, I am an elephant. Right? That doesn't make you an elephant. Anyone can say that. And so, yeah, you agree with them. Yeah, anyone can say they believe. I'm not talking about you saying you believe to be saved. I'm saying you have to believe to be saved. You need to trust Jesus. I'm not saying you just say the words that you, you believe. Yeah, you've got to actually believe it from your heart. You actually have to put your faith and trust on Jesus. And so I agree with them when they say, yeah, but anybody can say they believe. Yeah, I agree, because you can say, anybody can say anything. Like, it doesn't mean it's true, right? So I hope that's helpful for you, brethren. I just want to emphasize the fact that the power of God unto salvation is the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Hey, the whole world knows this message already, so it's your job to guide the unbeliever to understand these things. Okay, let's pray.